admit, as an engineer, I kind of geeked out on MacGyver. I mean, all that engineering with borrowed components, making a garage door opener transmitter out of a dinner fork, a lemon, a piece of string, and a broken gigapet. How cool is that? In the real engineering world, we do a lot of borrowing as well. We always want to grab this interface or that component that was originally designed for something else. And for the past few decades, our main source of stuff to borrow has been the PC. I mean, how many times have you done something with DDR interfaces or PCI or USB or Ethernet? Or even repurpose that old power supply. Hmm. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. Things developed for the commodity market are cheap, reliable, and well understood. They're perfect for saving engineering time and sometimes can just plug and play right into whatever we're designing. Now, however, mobile devices have knocked the PC off its pedestal as the go-to steal from. Um, I mean, borrow from commodity technology. But how many of us know which mobile stuff to use or how to connect to it? Mippy, anyone? Anyone? Today, my guest is Ted Marina from Lattice Semiconductor, and he's going to help us figure out easy ways to connect to that emerging wealth of mobile-based standards. Before we get started, remember to click the link. There you can download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. Welcome, Ted. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Amelia. It's great to be here. All right. So when we're doing our designs, we use a lot of stuff that has flowed down from the PC architecture days. But that's changing, right? Absolutely. That's correct. Everybody, I think, realizes that the PC was the dominant volume architecture for many, many years. Mm -hmm. But a couple of years ago, smartphones surpassed PC in volume. And in addition to that, tablets are expected to actually surpass PC architecture. So you have this mobile architecture that is really now driving high, high volume. And what I'm finding as I've been traveling around and talking to customers is that many of them are very interested to use mobile components and peripherals in their design, whether it's embedded design mm -hmm. or other. Sure. So I should be looking in the future to mobile standards in my design instead of PC. That makes sense. But you guys are an FPGA company. So, um, Ted, what are we talking about here? <laughs> well, that's a, that's a really good question, Amelia. So let me just kind of rewind for a second and go through what, what are normally people using FPGAs for? Yeah. There's four typical functions that people do with FPGAs. One of them is just offloading critical functions that a microprocessor is not well suited to do. Sure, yeah. There's also IO expansion and various connectivity where processors just don't have enough pins mm -hmm. to do the functions. The other two applications are bridging applications where you just have one bus that's not the same as the other and you need to connect them together. Yeah. The last one is something that I would classify as hardware acceleration, something that an FPGA is well suited to do, but a processor or other device just isn't well suited to do. All right, so we're moving more and more to mobile, but what are some of the standards we're looking at here? Well, that's a great question. In the PC world, the dominant architecture is PCI Express. Yeah. Everybody knows that. Sure. But in the mobile side, there are actually many different buses, and those are largely driven by a standards body called MIPI. Mm -hmm. And the MIPI standards body has a number of buses and architectures depending upon what peripheral we're talking about. When you look at a typical smartphone or a tablet, at the heart is actually an applications processor. Yeah. But there's cameras, there's sensors, audio, display, all kinds of peripherals. And each of these has their own different buses and interfaces. Right. And so that's really the challenge is that the PC architecture is well known. It's PCI Express. But the mobile architecture, it's some of these different MIPI interfaces. Okay. I'm with you, Ted. But most people don't identify FPGAs with mobile applications. Yeah, that's correct. And that's something that we are very focused on and helping provide solutions. So if you were to be interested in using a interface or a peripheral that's in a mobile architecture currently, we can help you out. 
Cool. When you actually think about the different MIPI buses, you could categorize them in a few different areas. Okay. There's very low-end CMOS-like single-ended buses that do simple functions, sensors, battery interfacing, slow speed control, and so on. Okay. But then there's also higher performance interfaces that are quite interesting. Those are referred to by MIPI as the DeFi. It's a particular bus. Okay. And that's mainly used for cameras and displays. So what's really exciting that we want to make sure that you know about is that ultra low density FPGAs can interface and bridge to these buses and these peripherals. Gotcha. Okay, cool. So for embedded designers who want to incorporate some of these higher performance peripherals from the mobile world, what are some of the challenges? The challenges, Amelia, really are around bridging from legacy peripherals to the mobile architecture peripherals. Okay. So let me give you some examples. Let's say that you have an image sensor that you're using in your application that's really good for low light. This is typically gonna have a bus interface like sub LVDS, high spy, or similar. Okay. But for that design, you get all excited about an application's processor to use. Well, those don't connect. That image sensor will not connect to the application processor. Yeah. So that's one challenge in the camera side. On the display side, someone may be really excited about the screen on their smartphone and want to use that for their own design. Yeah. Well, if you have an embedded processor or a microcontroller and you want to use a display, that is also going to have a mismatch in connectivity that will require a bridge. Sure. Typically, you have RGB interface or LVDS interface off of a micro or embedded processor, and the display that is in the mobile architecture is DSI. So these are mismatches and cause challenges for the design. All right, Ted, I think I got it now, but if I wasn't in the mobile world, these would be some classic bridging problems that I could use an FPGA for. Am I on the right track here? You're absolutely right, Amelia. Many people don't think of FPGAs to leverage an interface with mobile architecture. Yeah. However, Lattice has a portfolio of ultra low density FPGAs that can provide these types of interfaces. Our X02 device, which we announced a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. we've recently introduced an X03 architecture that has higher performance, lower cost, and that architecture is actually ideal for some of the higher performance mobile interfaces. In addition, our ICE products are lower end devices, and those are ideal for the lower end, single ended type of buses. So that entire portfolio is really well suited for mobile interfacing and bridging. Very cool. So I could see how, depending on my needs, I could pick any one of those. But let's dive down a little bit and look at some details. Mm, really? Okay. If you ask. Come on. <laughs> so let's take a look at the X03 architecture as an example. We created the architecture of this device and the I.O. rings of the part to okay. support both single-ended as well as high-performance interfacing. So we didn't want to put the high-performance interfacing on all of the pins because it drives the cost up. Yeah. But we knew that we needed it for a number of IOs. So what we did was in our bank zero and bank two of the architecture, we have very high performance interfaces in and out. And then on the remaining banks, we utilize more traditional single-ended type of lower speed interfaces. Gotcha. So we offer a mix of interfaces in that architecture. And that allows us to support many of the mobile buses that we were really recently talking about. Very cool. But a lot of times, Ted, people think of FPGAs as having these big old form factors. But what about those of us who may have our own form factor issues? What about that, Ted? Well, Amelia, if you had a design that was really space challenged, we absolutely have solutions in that space. The X03, just to take an example in this particular family, we have a number of wafer level chip scale packages. Okay. And those devices allow us to fit into various form factors, really small size, space constrained applications. We didn't want to just offer really aggressive small packages because some people are sensitive to the smaller 0.4 millimeter ball pitch. 
Mm-hmm. So we do have half millimeter and 0.8 millimeter pitches as well for those who want easier to manufacture packaging. So there's a range of packages and you don't have to worry about your form factor, or whether it's small, medium or large, we have it. Excellent. <laughs> okay, so Ted, why don't you walk me through an application real quick? Uh, what about say um, driving a display? Sure. So driving a display, one of the advantages of FPGA, just to kind of remind everybody, is that they're programmable, right? You can have it do many different things. What I've drawn up here is an application where, although it would seem that you could just directly connect a display to an application's processor, this diagram is really showing you that you could offer more than one source of a screen vendor. Ah. So whether it's an application processor on the left-hand side or an embedded processor, it doesn't really matter for our architecture. We can take in RGB, we could take in LVDS, we could take in DSI on the left-hand side. On the interface to the display, we can provide and bridge any of the necessary differences that vendor A LCD would have from vendor B or vendor C. Right. So by using our device, the small ultra low density device in between, we're allowing an engineer to have multiple sources for their display. Gotcha. Okay. So earlier you mentioned uh, something about image sensors. Mm Mm-hmm. I sure did. Let me give you an example of how our devices can be used to bridge for image sensors. So If you have an application and some embedded product that you use an image signal processor, maybe you have algorithms that you've tuned over the years and you Mm -hmm. want to continue to utilize those, we can allow that design to use a mobile image sensor, lower cost, very high quality. We bridge from the CSI2, which is the MIPI interface for an image sensor, to whatever bus you require for your image signal processor. So this is an application where we're allowing you to leverage a mobile image sensor to your embedded image signal processor. And even if you wanted to add multiple cameras, that's something, again, because of the programmability of FPGAs, you could do that. Cool, okay. So, Ted, let's recap a little bit. I think I might need a little refresher. Sure. So just to kind of recap what we've been talking about, I know a lot of times you may be thinking FPGAs are very expensive. You know, Lattice is really focused on the ultra low density, the lower end of the FPGA market. Mm -hmm. And the benefit of having that is these are very affordable architectures. They allow you to bridge mobile peripheral components, thus lowering the overall cost of your system. We have really small packaging available if you do have space constrained applications or tight size requirements. They're quite low power and these all also have reference designs. So we have reference designs readily available for cameras and displays as we mentioned. So for image sensors or LCD screens that people may want to interface and leverage from the mobile architecture, we have those solutions available. Very cool. Well, I think that's all I have time for. Thank you so much for joining me today, Ted. It was my pleasure. Thank you. Before we go, don't forget to click that link. There you can download a free white paper that further expands on this topic. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton. For more Chalk Talks, check out the EE Journal YouTube channel or the on-demand section of eejournal.com. 